The Black Dress by Timothy Banfield. Recorded by Timothy Banfield. Also recorded by Marissa Duran. Also recorded by Marissa Falzone. Copyright 2021. Day One. I had just gotten off work and was hating myself for letting Anne walk by without saying anything to her again. An all too familiar loathing permeated the air around me. The walk up to my front door was always silent and cold, but never as dreary as inside. Once inside my home, the loneliness of my empty space sank back in. I took a deep breath, letting the cold, stagnant air fill my lungs, and placed my shoulder bag and keys back in their usual places. A half table by the door, with marks and scratches, signifying the spots on its surface where my belongings always rested. I always found myself eating the same box meals while watching the same TV shows. The hours passed by as they always did, and then it was time for bed. I never could understand why I bought a king size because, despite all that space available to me, I always slept on the same side of the mattress. There was a section of the bed that neither I nor anyone else had ever been, and a pillow that had never been used. I set my alarm and fell straight to sleep. I mean, why wouldn't I? I had no thoughts to keep me up, and nothing to look forward to. Day 2 It was 7.30 in the morning. I woke up just as my alarm went off. I never hit the snooze, and I never dreamt. I just showered, dressed, ate, and left. I was always on time, like a well-oiled machine. Nine and a half hours later, I stepped through the door to my house and placed my pocket items in their resting spot without even looking. But strangely, as I was about to sit down, I felt a chill all over my body, a feeling as if something wasn't right. I looked around and saw nothing out of place. I rolled my shoulders, shaking off the feeling, and then sat down. The shows I watched were mediocre at best, but they had the ability to take me out of my head for a few hours. Once again, I finished my meal, showered, brushed my teeth, and slid into bed. Within seconds, I was asleep, and eight hours later, I was awake. Day 3 Today, Anne wasn't at work, so the self-hatred for saying nothing to get her to notice me didn't follow me back home. I placed the key in the door and grabbed the knob. I only made two steps inside when a cold chill rushed through me and out the door. My home felt like an icebox, but I couldn't see my breath. I quickly closed the door and ran to the thermostat. 77? Not the kind of temperature that I would consider freezing, but not hot either. To compensate, I set the system to 85 and closed the box. Afterward, I returned to the door and placed my keys and bag where they belonged. I had only been in my place for a few minutes and already felt not at home. It felt colder and more dreary than usual, but nothing was changed or out of place. I stood for a moment to see if anything spoke out to me as to why I felt the way I did, but no ideas came to mind. After I pondered this uneasiness, I went on with my boring routine. I placed a TV dinner in the microwave and sat in the same TV-watching position as before. That day, the episodes were reruns, but I watched them just the same. The show was almost over when I had the notion that there was someone watching me through the window. For a brief second, as I turned, I thought I saw a face right up against the glass before quickly moving away. I jumped up and ran to the window to see if anyone was there, but saw nothing. The night was calm and dark, with no movement of trees or bushes. After taking a good look over the entire yard, I closed the curtains and sat back down on the couch. My shows were over, I showered, and was off to bed. Day 4 I was awakened by my alarm clock, but as I leaned over to see it, I saw that the time was 9.02. I leaped out of my covers in a panic and ran to the bathroom to quickly brush my teeth. There was no time for a shower. I was already late. I ran to the closet, but for a moment, I forgot what I would normally wear. I grabbed the first thing I could find and threw it on as I stumbled down the stairs. I was almost out the door when I looked at my cell phone and saw that it was Sunday. My panic was needless. I didn't have to go to work. I held my phone to my forehead and laughed as I slid down the door with my back against it. 
As I sat there, I started to wonder, what could have happened? How did I forget what day it was? How could I have slept through my alarm for an hour and a half? Why did my own closet seem strange to me? I must have sat there for at least five minutes, thinking about what had happened, before realizing how much my neck itched. It felt like I had a bad mosquito bite. I got up from the floor and made my way back upstairs. Once in my bathroom, I looked into the mirror. My throat was red, from my left ear to my Adam's apple. There were no marks that I could see, but it was clearly inflamed. I grabbed some ibuprofen for the swelling, and then went to the tub to run myself a nice hot relaxing shower, hoping that that would be enough to soothe the itch. After getting out, my neck felt better, but I was still tired. In fact, I spent more time in the shower than usual, just standing there, staring at the drain. After getting dressed, I made myself a big breakfast and watched some TV. Later, I went to the store and bought some dinners as well as a louder alarm clock. I finished out my day with laundry and an interesting book before bed. It was a self-help book for my mother, for people who suffered from depression. I set my new alarm and fell right to sleep. Day 5 The following morning was normal. No mistakes and no confusion. I was halfway through my shift before I started to feel ill. I tried to just play it off, but from the way I looked, everyone could tell something was wrong, including Anne, who actually came up to me and asked if I needed to go home. For some strange reason, her making eye contact with me is what pushed me over the edge. I excused myself and asked my boss if I could leave and drove to the hospital. I waited for hours in pain before I was finally able to see the doctor. I was told that I most likely had the flu and that I should just stay home for the rest of the week. Before heading home, I called work to tell them what the doctor had said, and was the one to take the call. I told her what the doctor recommended, and she assured me that she would tell the boss. Before hanging up, she told me to get well and to feel better soon. I think that day was the most that we had ever talked. I returned home with a full day ahead of me and no idea what to do. My body was cold and my head was aching. I searched the TV for hours, but nothing interested me. I mean, since I was normally at work, I hardly knew what would be on during the day. I eventually turned the television off and started reading the self-help book again. I was a few chapters in and lost in thought when another chill ran through me. This time, it felt as if it came from the window behind me. As I turned and looked over my shoulder, I saw the curtains moving with a slight sway which I knew was impossible because the window was closed. I dropped the book as I looked out past the curtains and into the yard. I couldn't quite make out what I was seeing, but what I believe I saw was a woman in a black dress standing 30 feet from my window, looking into the house. As the curtain swung between me and the glass, I lost sight of her for a moment. But then, just as they moved back out of the way, she was gone. I ran out of my house to where I thought I saw her and looked around, but there was no sign that anyone was ever there. Afterward, the night was calm and not a sound could be heard. I gazed out into the streets for several more minutes before I went back inside. I then locked the doors and windows before finishing up my evening. As soon as I was upstairs, I scanned the yard one more time through my bedroom window before showering and going to bed. I set my alarm as I always did, even though I wasn't expected at work the following day. I slept for a few hours before being woken up by the sound of scratching and rustling in my bedroom. I looked around the room to see what was making all the racket, but saw nothing. I waited patiently for a while to see if I could make out the source of all the commotion, but after a few moments of listening intently, all was silent. I stayed quiet for another ten minutes in bed making sure nothing was in the house, before laying my head back down on the pillow and drifting back to sleep. Day 6 It was two in the morning. I was on my back, my arms to my sides, and my head on the pillow, facing straight up. I was lying there unable to move, with my eyes wide open, staring upward. Not just the ceiling itself, but at something that I found staring back at me. 
A woman. The same one I had seen in my yard through the windows earlier. She was wearing a black dress, which seemed to be a long sleeve Victorian-style gown that came down to her ankles. She had long black hair that framed her pale face, and she wore bright red lipstick, which matched her piercing red eyes. From the looks of her, she must have been in her twenties, but the lighting and shadows made it hard to be sure. I can't say how long we locked eyes, but what I can say is that neither of us blinked for the entire exchange. The room was painfully quiet, with only my shaky breaths and rapid heartbeats to fill my ears. No noise came from my sinister visitor. In fact, it didn't look as if she was breathing at all. But it wasn't how she looked that left me paralyzed in terror. It was seeing her stuck to the ceiling as if she were the one lying on her back and I was the one hovering above. Her hair didn't hang down towards me, as one would expect, nor did her gown. They, like her, were pressed and held to the ceiling with an unknown force. As she stared through me, she rested her hands on her stomach, with her fingers overlapping each other. She seemed as if she was waiting for me to fall back asleep. It felt like hours passed as I laid there waiting for her to kill me before I blacked out unexpectedly and woke up to my alarm clock. Just as I heard the buzz, I screamed and jumped out of my bed before falling to the floor. I looked at the ceiling to see if she was still there and then quickly scanned the rest of the room. There was nothing. Was it a dream? It had to be a dream. How could someone climb walls and ceilings like that? Who was she? I spent hours searching the house for any sign of her presence from last night. However, despite me canvassing the entire property, I found nothing. I was about to call the cops when my neck started to itch on the same side as before. I ran to the upstairs bathroom and looked into the mirror. Again, I saw no marks, bites, or scratches on my neck, just redness. I took my flu medication and had a long hot shower before returning downstairs. My neck felt better, but my body was still shaking. I went back to my phone to call the police, but before I could hit the call button, my knees went out from under me and I collapsed onto the floor. I landed in a heap on the carpet just behind my couch as my phone slid out from my hand. An undialed 911 was still visible on the screen. Again, I passed out and remained unconscious until an hour later, when I was awoken by the buzz of my phone, which was now lying beside me on the ground. I was groggy and out of it, but I could see that it was my mother calling. This was probably just another checking in on me call. She always called twice a week for the same reason she bought me the book. I pulled myself up onto my knees and up against the couch. I had totally forgotten how I got there and what had happened. I answered the phone and talked to my mother for 20 minutes. My memory was still blurry, so I wasn't sure what to tell her other than I was fine and happy that she called. She reminded me that she would always be there for me and that she loved me before saying goodbye. I had just hung up the phone when I realized what had happened. My memory was a bit hazy on the details, maybe from the fall or being sick, but I could no longer be sure of what I had experienced. I debated calling her back to inform her, but if I'm not positive that what I saw last night was real, would it be worth scaring her too? I made my way to the couch and sat there for a while to think before heading to the kitchen to make myself some much-needed food. Was it all just a flu-induced dream? If so, there would be no need to get my mother involved, or the police for that matter. I placed my TV dinner in the microwave and walked out of the kitchen for a moment. Seconds later, my phone buzzed. It was a text from Anne. The text read, Hey, just seeing how you're doing. Hope you're feeling better. Her text was almost enough to make me forget the nightmare from last night. The thought of her checking up on me, when she didn't have to brought a smile to my face. I was about to reply when I smelled smoke coming from the kitchen. I quickly ran in and threw open the microwave. A thick black cloud of food ash billowed out from where my mundane meal was supposed to be. Somehow, I had burned my food, but how? It was set to the same time I had always set it. I threw it into the trash and prepared another meal. Sitting on my couch, I found myself in search of something to watch, but... Again, turn the TV off and reach for my book instead. 
I read a few pages and then stopped to look behind me at the curtains. Though I was prepared this time, they weren't moving, nor was there a chill in the room. Maybe it had all just been a bad dream brought on by the flu. I finished my nightly time wasting and headed to bed. Day 7 I rested for a good four hours before I found myself in the same nightmare as before. Above me was the same woman in the black dress, and just like the previous encounter, I was too scared to move. She continued to look straight through me as we lay there opposite of each other. Our mutual focus stayed fixed on the other for a painfully long period of unbroken silence that lingered between us. However, just as I heard a cat knock over a trash can outside, my nightly tormentor suddenly broke eye contact for the first time. She sharply turned her head to glare out the window at the pesky feline with a notable look of annoyance. She stared out at the animal for a second before baring her bright white fangs with a territorial hiss which drove the tabby away. At that moment, I got a good look at her one-inch canines. Seeing her continuous, inhuman traits being put on display and coming to the slow realization that this may not be a dream, fearful tears started running down my face. She slowly looked back at me as her bright red lips curled back over her teeth. My body was shivering even more than before, and my blood was running colder than it ever had. We must have continued like that for an hour before I quickly lost consciousness, abruptly ending this new, horrifying, and otherworldly bedtime routine. When I came to, via the alarm, I fell to the side of my bed and huddled in the corner. For the remainder of the afternoon, I could do nothing but cry and scream while clutching my swollen and irritated neck. However, unlike my previous mornings of dazed confusion, I did nothing about it. As far as I knew, my life was over. It was only a matter of time. I called the cops that evening to investigate my house, but no sign of any intruder was found. I also couldn't tell them the whole story, because I knew that they wouldn't believe me. I mean, who would? After they left, I called a psychiatrist friend of mine, who I had known for many years. After hearing the distress in my voice, as I recounted the experience I had been having over the last few days, he quickly dropped what he was doing to FaceTime with me. He was one of the few people I knew I could trust, no matter how ridiculous what I was saying would sound. We talked for hours as I sat curled up on the couch before my heart began to settle at a more relaxed rate. Though he couldn't fully analyze what I had been seeing, nor could he prove it was all just a sickness-induced hallucination. It was helpful to have someone to talk to about it. The more rational explanation that my terrors were the result of the flu rested easy with me. But despite his efforts, his calm, alternative interpretation of the facts didn't really answer my questions, nor did it vindicate all that was happening. After reminding me he was always a phone call and a short drive away, we ended with a relaxing breathing exercise before hanging up. Now being back in the silence of my house, I sat on the floor for several minutes before looking at my phone. It was now nine at night, another entire day ruined. Feeling sad, and not knowing if I would be dead the following morning, I texted Anne as a last-ditch effort for comfort. I asked her how her day went and waited for a reply. But after ten minutes with no response, I threw my phone away in disgust for myself. Why had I picked this moment to text her? From my perspective, I was haunted by a demon, and from her perspective, I was just some weirdo at home with the flu. You know what? Why not let it kill me? What am I holding on to? Besides, this wasn't the first time death had crossed my mind, and nothing had gotten better since then. I could only count the things I had to live for on one hand, and most of those were hardly even worth a mention. I stood up, placed my phone on the table, turned off the lights, and headed upstairs. I showered, brushed my teeth, and went to bed. Day 8 Like clockwork, at two in the morning, she loomed over me in her usual way, with those red eyes, black dress, and red lips. This time, however, I wasn't scared, nor was I confused as to the severity of the situation. I merely looked up at her and lay still. 
A full hour rolled by, and my eyes were wet with tears. But again, not in fear for my life, but because I knew I was ready to die. Finally, I had had enough of this staring game, and forced my voice out. Kill me! I screamed in an emotional demand. With my outburst, having broken the silence like pain glass, I could see her face change from a cold stare to a look of confusion. Her shift in expression took me by surprise. What are you waiting for? Do it! I continued. But strangely, her only response to my exclamations was a slight tilt of her head and a curious blink. Despite her lack of reaction, I carried on with my pleading. Come on, please. I have nothing going for me. I hate my life, my job, and I'm all alone here. What was happening? What was going on? This intruder, who I was sure had ill intent, was making no move on me, even with an open invitation. She remained impassive, with no sign of heeding my pleas. The tense quiet built back up as a few more seconds passed, with more tears rolling down my face. I know you've been stalking me and been biting me at night, so just, just finish it. I waited impatiently for the kiss of death for another ten minutes before I became so tired I fell asleep. In the morning, I woke up to my alarm with no issue. Unlike some of my previous nights, I didn't oversleep, and I didn't shoot up from my pillow in a cold sweat. I looked around the room to see if anything different had happened from the previous nights, but saw nothing of consequence. I also didn't feel weak or cold, nor did my neck itch as I was expecting. I made my way to the bathroom for my now routine examination, but to my surprise, found no redness about my neck. I threw on some casual clothes as I listened for any sound of movement. Maybe she was still here and waiting. I then made my way downstairs and searched the rest of the house for any sign of her. What did she want? What was she waiting for? I looked out my window to where I first saw that black dress but again found nothing. Frustrated and confused, I sat on my couch with my head in my hands. This couldn't be a dream, could it? I lost myself in thought for a minute before I looked up. The book my mother had given me was on the coffee table, open to the last page. Just then, my phone buzzed. It was the daily I love you message from my mom. But being that I was still too preoccupied with the mystery that was unfolding in my house, I didn't reply and just placed the phone back down on the table. I wasn't finished searching for answers. I couldn't carry on with my day without resolving some of the nagging questions that had planted themselves firmly in the forefront of my mind. I ran upstairs and started pulling out boxes from the hallway closet so I could get to the attic. I pulled on the rope to the hatch and unfolded the ladder so I could climb up. Once inside, I slowly crept to the wall and flipped on the light switch. I fully expected to see my mysterious intruder standing there in the shadows, but again, I saw no one. I took a few steps forward to better peer around the boxes and corners, craning my neck over the dusty memories I had yet to discard. However, no matter how ready I was to catch an unearthly invader red-handed behind the cobwebs of my poorly lit storage space, I remained unsuccessful in my investigation. I was about to head back downstairs when I noticed footprints of bare feet in the dust on the floor. I followed the trail all the way to the back where they stopped at an open box of photographs. Just outside the container was a single frame lying face down by itself. I bent over and picked it up, but strangely, didn't have to wipe away any layer of dust. Its glass side had already been freed from its expected coating of filth. The lone photo I was holding was one of me and my father back when I was ten. It was our first football game together. Why was this particular picture out? I held the memento in my hands, thinking back on a simpler time, when suddenly I caught sight of a face inches from my shoulder in the reflection of the glass. As soon as those distinct red eyes flashed open, I quickly dropped the photograph back into the box and spun around. I was now facing the darkness, straining my eyes and preparing myself for confrontation, but again found myself standing in solitude. However, having my stalker vanish and reappear on numerous occasions, I found it hard to believe she had actually left. 
Hello? I called. I know you're there! I gave the room a few seconds to echo before continuing. What do you want with me? But regardless of my attempts to force her hand, no response found its way back to me. Confirming that I was alone again, I climbed back down the ladder and folded it back into the attic hatch. After closing the closet door, I heard a small noise in the living room. It sounded as if something had fallen to the floor. I quickly ran down the steps and came around the corner to find my phone buzzing on the carpet. The vibrations of it in silent mode must have slowly slid it off the table. I picked up the device and answered it. It was my mother. She was worried when I didn't reply to her text from earlier. I had totally forgotten to reply to her message and must have left her in a state of concern. I sat down on the couch and spent four minutes bullshitting a happy conversation to put her mind at ease. We ended by exchanging I love yous and goodbyes. After hanging up, I spent the remainder of the day cleaning and paying bills. My idea was to carry on as if all was fine until sunset, which seemed to be the time when the ominous woman Dorn in Black was most likely to strike her fatal blow. I wrote out a note that night for those who I was sure might find me dead. In the note were a few thoughts of regret. I left a peaceful goodbye, and a, I'm sorry for what I had done for my mother. I'm sure I could have written a whole book of feelings in great detail on all the reasons I was accepting this closing to the chapter of my life, but knew that stretching out a painful farewell would be too much for her to handle. I didn't want to continue to worry her, but the only way I thought to release her from having to check up on me was for her to not have to do it anymore. But despite not dragging on too much, I took my time writing my goodbye. I wanted to make sure it was perfect. Also, having written many letters like this in the past made the format all too familiar. Once I was finished, I placed the note in a drawer on the stand by my bed before finishing out my day. I didn't eat any of my bland, microwavable dinners, and I had no interest in my boring and poorly written TV shows. In fact, I don't think I even showered or brushed my teeth before bed. I just lay there and waited patiently for the embrace of death with open arms. Day 9 I was on edge as I slept, waiting for her to appear, and even the slightest activity outside would jostle me. Several times during the night, I woke up thinking I heard something, but quickly discovered that it was nothing before falling back to sleep. I rested soundly for several more hours, past two o'clock, which was the time I would normally find her hovering over me. But I was eventually awakened by a voice at a surprising 4.30 in the morning. As I was lying on my back, I slowly opened my eyes to the ceiling. I was sure I would see her, but oddly, she wasn't there. Neither silhouette, red eyes, nor black dress adorned the empty space. However, I felt the weight of something next to me on the bed, on top of the covers. From beside me came an unfamiliar female voice with a soft Irish accent. You take a lot of showers. It was the first time I had heard her talk. The sound of her voice was both warm and calming, and had no trace of menace to it at all. Being that this was far from what I expected to hear, I took a while to respond to this peculiar introduction. I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I stammered. I'm germophobic and, and gynophobic, as, as well as many other things. Upon hearing my reply, she turned her head upwards, like me, to face the ceiling. A few seconds came and went, as my body clenched just listening to her quietly breathe beside me. After a time, she put her attention back on me. Why do you want to die? She asked. My heart skipped a beat, and it felt like I finally took a breath after holding it in for too long. This was the third person to ask me this question, and it never ceased to hurt. Do you want to die? She continued. The words to answer her were there, but were too painful to say. A lump formed in the back of my throat, while the memories of past years cluttered my mind. I took in much-needed air to fight back the tears as I evaded her probing. Instead, I swallowed hard before changing the subject. Uh, are you a vampire? I asked. 
She let out a quick sigh as she accepted the new topic. <sighs> I guess so. This was weird. We were having a normal conversation. Or as normal as one with a possible undead could be. As many times as I had been at a loss for words to talk to Anne, I was even more unprepared for this exchange. Have... have you been drinking... my blood? I stuttered. She didn't hesitate to give me a matter-of-fact reply. Yes, I have. How come you leave no bite marks? She laughed a little at my question, then with a smile said, <laughs> I'm not good. I paused before asking my follow-up. Am I going to become a vampire? No. She answered in a reassuring tone. Unless you die because I drank all of your blood, but I'm not here to do that. Sighing in relief from her words, I turned back to her. Are... are there more of you? We lay there for a moment in silence. I could tell she was thinking back, and something about searching through those memories was troubling her. I haven't seen another like me in... two hundred years. The answer seemed more to herself than to me. I couldn't believe what I had just heard. Two hundred years? Could someone live that long? My head spun from the idea. Still, anyone who could climb walls, disappear without a trace, and drink blood couldn't be expected to operate by the same rules as the rest of us. How old are you? I asked. She took her time as she thought back, but eventually said with no confidence. At least three hundred years old, I think. Uh, I can't remember. We both sat there quietly for a minute, before I asked, Why hunt me? And why let me see you? She, like me, remained engaged in this abnormal line of dialogue. As far as why hunt you, it's easy to stalk someone with a routine. As far as why I let people see me, fear makes the blood taste sweeter. Her answer took me back to my usual state of paranoia. However, seeing her face put my mind at ease. She didn't say it with any joy. It was more with shame. It was as if she hated the fact that what she did for her own delight tormented those she stalked. That first night would have been the last. But I was unsatisfied by the sadness I could taste in your blood. A bitterness that was all too familiar. With that, she looked back at me. Now, why do you want me to kill you? There was almost a scolding to her tone, but also an unexpected tenderness. The focus was now back on me, and I could no longer avoid being honest. She had been forthcoming with me, and it was only fair for me to do the same. I'm alone. I see. She said as she turned back to the ceiling. She then met my openness with her own. You know... She continued. I'm more alone than you are. In fact, I make you seem overcrowded with friends. In those moments, I felt sad. Not for myself, but for her. The idea of death by her hand looming over me evaporated. For the first time ever, I had met someone I took pity on more than myself. Before I could speak, she turned over onto her side with her hands resting in front of her, and looked me in the eyes. I flinched a little, but didn't panic. It will be morning soon. You should get some sleep, she whispered. Even though I no longer had the fear of death about me, I was still apprehensive. But, like her, I turned on my side to face the middle of the bed. Our faces were now about a foot apart. Her eyes were already closed by the time I rested the side of my head on the pillow. In the soft glow, of what little moonlight was shining through the window. Her features didn't scare me as they had before. I tried not to, but I couldn't help but stare at her smooth, ivory skin. With her eyes closed and her fangs covered, she appeared as normal as any other young woman. But unlike anyone else, she was in my house, and she was happily resting on my bed. I closed my eyes and waited a while before allowing myself to fall asleep. After a few seconds with no signs of trickery, I felt my exhaustion getting the better of me. It's okay if you need blood, I whispered. She smiled and gave a small chuckle before responding. <laughs> okay. When I awoke, it was noon. I looked over to the other side of the bed, which for the first time had been occupied. 
but instead of seeing even the black hair of the woman who, not too long ago, induced sleep paralysis, I now only saw wrinkles in the sheets. Afterward, I got out of bed and went to the bathroom to look in the mirror, time yet again to see what kind of damage she had done to my throat. Stretching my skin to get a better view, I found that my neck had only a small red spot that was barely visible. So she doesn't want to hurt me? I made my way downstairs and opened up the laptop to browse the internet for answers. I searched every website I could find on vampires and the undead, but few articles seemed to agree on how they operated. There were theories all over the place about vampiric biology and mythology. However, the majority of them were inconsistent. Though my web browsing felt like a complete waste of time, I gathered what general information I could. After collecting some resources, I realized I could just ask her. If she was coming back that night, that is. I spent the rest of the day watching movies, documentaries, and reading books on the topic of the Nosferatu. I also did some special grocery shopping. Not the repulsive TV dinners I stocked my freezer with on a daily basis, but some actual food that a human with standards might bring home. I wanted to say, thank you for not killing me with a nice dinner. I mean, what else could I do? She would either still kill me or become my friend, both of which were preferable to what I currently had in my life. Day 10, Part 1 It was 1.52 in the morning. I had brought some candles earlier that day for tonight's thank you dinner. I also found a nice tablecloth in the attic and cleaned it before setting it up in the dining area. I was arguing with myself, going back and forth with the decorations, trying to arrange everything in just the right way. I stood there, biting my tongue, agonizing over the table. <clears throat> Is all this too much? I wanted to make my supernatural guest feel more at home, especially since she was from hundreds of years ago. I wish I knew what her upbringing was like. What if she had been born of a higher class? After suffering from my lack of culture for a while, I threw up my hands and said, eh, screw it, and made my way to the kitchen. It was getting late, and I needed to finish cooking the steaks. I had a few meal items left to prepare before she arrived. 2.03. I had just finished setting the silverware in their places when I heard the window from upstairs open and then slide shut. Even though we had formally met, and I was positive she wished me no harm, it still made me shiver to know this female ghoul was creeping into my house. Our last interaction was calm and friendly enough, but something about her still dropped the temperature in the room. I waited for a moment, looking into the other room, and watched as the moonlight coming from my bedroom illuminated the wall by the stairs. Her thin, feminine frame crept across the walls as she moved down towards me. The sign of her presence was still unnerving, due to the unearthly way she moved through my house. Seeing her get closer, I turned back to the kitchen to quickly finish meal preparations before reducing the heat. Just as she reached the bottom of the steps, I removed my apron and casually turned the corner to stand in the doorway of the kitchen. She stood with one hand on the railing, as she looked me over with a slightly confused expression. I tried to smile as naturally as possible, but my uncomfortable state was televised through the shifting of my feet, shakiness of my hands, and a single bead of sweat on my forehead. In my awkward way, I gestured to the kitchen. Dinner's ready, I blurted. She stared at me for the longest of time, before peering around my shoulder and seeing the candles, a tablecloth, and silverware laid out. I froze in place as she scrutinized the dining table behind me with her unreadable face. She took a moment before straightening back up to again meet my gaze. What are you doing? She quietly and seriously asked. Did I do something wrong? If so, I might die tonight anyway. I cleared my throat before answering. I, uh, wanted to, you know, do something nice for you. I tried my best to stay calm, but my words were starting to get shuffled before leaving my mouth. Why? She continued. More sweat started rolling down my face. Was the thermostat broken again? Because? I took a second to arrange my thoughts before another traffic jam of words made me sound like an idiot. I took a deep breath. Because you 
didn't kill me, even after I asked to die. Upon hearing this, she raised her eyebrows and tilted her head, while I waited patiently for her to respond. We remained there in a cordial standoff for a while, before she gracefully took her time with the last few steps down the stairs. So, what are we having? My now welcome intruder asked. Oh, uh, salad, spaghetti, steak, pie. Now hearing myself say these things out loud, I realized how mismatched this combination might have been, especially to someone who may have dined on pheasant under glass in their heyday. Amused by my nervousness, she smiled. How did you prepare the steaks? Uh, mine is uh, medium well, but I, I wasn't sure how you wanted yours, you know, rare and all. Stopping two feet from me, she looked down at herself as she gently brushed the subtle wrinkles out of her dress before clasping her hands in front of her and looking back into my eyes. She almost seemed like a completely different person as she played the part of the dinner guest with a warm smile. Medium rare, please, she said as she walked around me towards the dining room. I'm not an animal, after all. After she passed me by with no intimidating contact, I sighed in relief. Everything in my body told me this was a bad idea, but her non-aggressive behavior around me at the time was helping me relax. I would say my nerves were half due to the fact that she was a supernatural night stalker, and the other half was more because of my other issues. Day 10, Part 2 Fifteen minutes into our evening, and we were just now starting on our salads, with our steaks soon on the way. I was trying hard to act as gentlemanly as possible, but had never really been in a situation where being formal and proper was actually required. I had had many business meetings and work gatherings where a more suit-and-tie dress was recommended, but the events were always far from a high-class ball. Most of the time, it was more just co-workers in fancier clothes still acting how they normally did. As the time passed, I was trying my best to look calm, but I'm sure she could tell that I was the farthest from it. She was sitting at the table, waiting for me to bring the food in. I smiled, bringing the salads as the starter for tonight. Feeling far out of my element, I tried my best to present the plates with as much finesse as I could, but only knew of presentation in this manner from film and TV. I must have looked like a fool. After setting her salad down, I walked over to my side and started with my own food. But as I looked down at my fork, I remembered that I had added garlic and herb to the seasoning and quickly stood up. I reached over the table to grab the fork that she had an inch from her mouth. Don't eat it! I blurted in panic. She calmly took a moment as she raised an eyebrow. Why? She inquired. Because I accidentally added garlic. She looked at the plate and then back to me before smiling and taking a bite off her fork. She finished chewing and swallowing before looking me right in the eye. Why would garlic be a problem? My brain smashed into a metaphorical brick wall as what I thought I knew was just put out by the trash. I was at a complete loss for words. My mind stayed in gridlock with a short internal debate. Why would that be a problem? I slowly realized that movies and books weren't a sufficient source of information on something that no one actually knew was real. So, you people don't have... I treaded lightly over my words, as she just shook her head before I could finish speaking. I slowly retracted myself back into my chair and tried to act like I had said nothing. But screaming something stupid at one's guest across a table is hard to forget in a short amount of time. The meal carried on with no more outbursts from me, and no conversation at all for that matter. Now that I could see her fully in the light, and not defying gravity over my vulnerable sleeping self, I could see that she was more ladylike than I could have imagined. She sat and ate with elegance. With her napkin in her lap, elbows off the table, and back straight, she took small bites at a time. Her posture and behavior forced me to readjust myself into what I approximated would be an appropriate level of manners from my end. I guess this is how people are supposed to dine with each other. During the meal, my guest took her time looking around the house from her chair. I don't know what she was looking at, since I would have imagined she had already crawled over every square inch of the place. 
Meanwhile, I, on the other hand, was doing my best not to stare at her almost completely white skin. She looked almost porcelain in the candlelight. Crap, the candlelight was too much, wasn't it? We ate most of our meal in awkward silence before any attempt at starting a conversation was spoken. So, um, what's your name? I said, making sure to swallow a mouthful of food first before speaking. She stopped and had to think for a while before finally responding. Abigail? She said it with a lack of confidence at first, but eventually nodded in assurance. Yes, Abigail. At least, I believe so. It's just been so long. It's been too long to remember? I asked. That and it's been a while since anyone has asked me. She looked over the living room again and then turned to me. You have a lovely home. I took a quick look around to see what she was talking about. I obviously knew what was in the room, but had no idea what would make her think it's lovely. I guess. I mean, it's all right. I shrugged and turned back to her. What's your place like? She was quiet for a moment before answering my question. It's an old clock tower that is well past its prime, but it has a nice view. After giving her response, she broke eye contact to look down at her food. I hesitated before continuing, thinking I might have upset her, which, obviously, was the last thing I wanted to do. Oh? I swallowed another bite of steak. You don't live in a mansion like in all the movies? I laughed a little, hoping she knew what I was talking about. She looked back up at me, with a raised eyebrow. Like in movies? Her putting the ball back in my court and waiting for me to elaborate made me feel stupid. I mean, y yeah? She squinted her eyes a bit with a thinking back look on her face again before straightening up, swallowing more food, and giving an actual reply. No, but I used to. Oh, really? I asked as I hopped between confusion and intrigue. How long ago was that? She took a deep breath and smiled in a reminiscing kind of way. I don't know. She seemed to like the conversation more with my interest in her history. Honestly, I've lived in so many places over the centuries, it's difficult to remember them all. It dawned on me that this was the first time in what felt like forever that I had had a back and forth with someone that wasn't about work, man or woman. The peacefulness of the evening raised my confidence in my skills as a host. My questions continued. Where are you from? London. However, my family and I were originally from Ireland, before my father lost his company. He ended up owing some less than friendly people a lot of money, and in order to pay off his debts, we ended up being sold as Irish slaves and were brought to the American colonies. Though the topic got sadder, she seemed at ease sharing it with me. Hearing her backstory, my heart sank into my chest. It was like when you first find out about horrible things in history from your teacher for the first time. My mind flooded with all the horrible things she must have seen and experienced over the many years of recent human history. I could have asked for more details, but I decided to stay quiet and polite listening to the rest of her story. Abigail continued. We were supposed to work for a certain number of years to work off the money owed, and then we could go back to our old home. She was now staring at the small flame of one of the candles. Her expression dropped to one of more pain. We didn't know at the time, but there was something else hiding on the lower deck of the ship. Her story progressed with a sad anger building in her eyes. Something unnatural that wanted to flee to the new world as well. She went silent for a moment and again left me speechless and ill-equipped to move the dialogue forward. But there was also something that told me to keep our exchange going, no matter how horrifying it ended up being. After a pause, I placed my utensils down with a low voice, leaning in to dig deeper. Is that how you became a vampire? She didn't look at me as she answered. Yes. I didn't make it to land before I was pronounced dead. We were all getting scared when we heard that something was happening to the African slaves on the lower decks. They were going missing and were thought to have jumped ship. But none of us ever heard the bodies hit the water. The now sinister tale was roasting me from the inside with fear. The romantic idea of vampires was rapidly fading with every painful memory of hers. In one conversation, I had heard a first-hand account of being sold into a dentured servitude, sharing a vessel with African slaves, and the monstrous horror that slaughtered them both. She took another good breath before continuing. To keep my long story short, 
I woke up in a field buried only a foot deep in a bag. I never found my family, or ever saw them again. I'm sorry, I said in the most compassionate voice I could. She looked back at me with an attempt to smile naturally as she recounted. In that second, I caught sight of the tear that she must have been holding back. I have been running away from the sun and people that want me dead ever since. After forcing a fake smile, she leaned back down to finish her food as if to say, Well, now that that's over. And there I was, sitting across from her in the house, where I was always sad and wallowing in self-pity. Just the first half of her story made how I felt feel completely trivial. I looked down at my plate and realized I wasn't hungry anymore. Man, did I start feeling like crap. After thinking, a new question came to me. How many more of you are there? As I asked, she kept looking down at her food. She replied in a small voice. I don't know. I believe I'm the last. Or at least I hope so. I hung my head down in shame, thinking I had ruined the once nice meal by bringing her pain back to the surface. Sorry, I... I didn't mean to ask too many personal questions. She tilted her head up to me. A tender smile graced her lips. No, it's fine. She said. Really? I responded. My vampire guest nodded politely. Besides, I have a few of my own. Okay, shoot. After saying this, I shook my head as I figured modern terms might not translate well. Oh, uh, no, I mean, go for it, as in, like, uh, ask away. I smiled awkwardly as I sat myself up straight for my turn in the conversation. She shook her head as she slightly laughed at my uncomfortable posture before gently placing her napkin on the table. No. She thought carefully, choosing the right words, before she calmly asked point-blank. What happened to your father? Day 10, Part 3 Hearing her directly target the one topic I feared the most, her hard-hitting question harpooned my chest. Every joint in my body seized up for a moment. Meanwhile, she sat quietly looking right into my eyes, patiently awaiting my response. My blood went cold again, as these memories were the hardest for me to talk about, but I think she knew that. I didn't want to answer at first, but seeing how she shared so openly about her pain, it wouldn't be right if I didn't do the same. But despite me readying myself to fill my half of the dinner conversation, I stayed frozen just looking back at her. When I first met you, she added, I felt your pain. And although I can't read minds, I can tell that there are so many things you're trying so hard to forget. She slid her hand a little ways across the table towards me. I've tasted the anguish in your blood, remember? Her leaning in towards me was making my fighting back tears less successful than hers. But as she spoke and looked at me, her expression started to match mine. Something about how she was speaking was making me think she truly cared, and that in itself deserved my answer. I sat my fork down, pushed my meal away, and slid back in my chair a little. I took a huge breath to slow my heart rate before taking my turn to share. It's hard to believe, but I used to be more foolish. As I spoke, my eyes became redder. Her name was Sasha. We were young. I looked away from Abigail as I spoke to look at the wall. She didn't actually care about me. She was just playing games, but I wouldn't listen. I told everyone we were going to get married, but my father told me I was being a teenage idiot. Thinking of my father always made me cry, and this time was no different. He and I fought a lot, saying things to each other no one should ever say, especially not your own family. Tears rolled down my face with every difficult word. Abigail remained facing me, focusing on the side of my head. She didn't make a sound while she waited for more of my story. My voice shook as I continued. We ended up getting into a physical fight, and I hurt him pretty badly. I thought I was a man, and I didn't need him telling me what to do anymore. After that, I ran away from home and stayed with a friend who my parents didn't really know about. I paused and looked back over at my guest across the table. 
The whole time she hadn't moved an inch. However, she was crying along with me during my mental playback of those days. We were quiet for a while before she calmly encouraged me to carry on. Please continue, she said. I wiped the water from my eyes before suffering more of my own memories. After three days, my father started looking for me. I should have gone back home. It was now getting harder for me to speak calmly through the emotions. He was driving all over town, all night, talking to everyone we knew. I took deep breaths as my own story was getting harder to endure. He was driving through an intersection. He had a green light, but the other car didn't. A sports car with a drunk driver and a drunk passenger slammed right into him at full speed. The entire left side of the car was destroyed. A sledgehammer of regret was now beating me up from the inside. I was no longer holding back my tears and couldn't have, even if I wanted to. He died in the hospital from internal bleeding. You're okay. From the other side of the table, my vampire friend softly sent words of comfort, as it was obvious how hard this was for me. I sucked in more air and tried to hold myself together. Driving the car that hit him was my girlfriend and her fiancé. She was the drunk driver of the car. I didn't even find out about the accident until it was on the news the next day. My emotional roller coaster swung from pain to anger for myself. Shortly after that, I tried killing myself. It should have been me in the car wreck. After finishing my reason for holding myself hostage in this lonely home, I dropped my head in a loud, ugly cry. I covered my face with my hands, no longer caring about posture, elbows on the table, or even the food at all. I only wanted to hide my face in shame as I wept for how much I hated who I was and what I had done. With my head down, I felt movement at the other end of the table, just before hearing her chair slide a little ways across the floor. Slowly, she got up and walked over to my side of the dining table. I never got to say I'm sorry! I screamed, hoping it would be loud enough for my father to hear me as well. As I yelled, my vampire friend placed a gentle hand on the back of my head and pulled it close to her chest. She placed her head on top of mine and started stroking my hair. She didn't say anything other than the softest of shushes. <laughs> my mother forgave me, but I can't bring myself to forget or to forgive myself for what I've done. I'm taking it day by day, hoping it will get easier to live with, but it doesn't. It never does. I have an attic full of things I can't stomach to look at and people I can't talk to for too long because it hurts too much and a life I can't live because I don't think I deserve it. I still wish it was me who was dead. From over my head, I continued to hear the lullaby-like shushing sounds and words of support from Abigail. No. No, you don't. It wasn't your fault. You didn't know. I grabbed the napkin off the table, trying to wipe away the snot from my face as she held me and ran her fingers over my hair. I had already broken past the worst of my trauma, and there was no reason to stop now. My mother keeps checking up on me, because she knows I might do something to myself. And my therapist is always a phone call away, and I can't find myself in a real relationship without feeling like they're lying to me, or somebody might get hurt again. I don't deserve to be happy, and I don't deserve to be loved. You're wrong, she said, still softly but slightly demanding. However, I didn't take the statement to heart and carried on with my self-loathing. Even now, what I've been through doesn't even compare. But I was interrupted from finishing that statement by a firm press of her delicate fingers against my lips. After hearing me say all of this, Abigail pulled my head away from her dress and placed both hands on the sides of my face. She then lifted my head slowly towards hers and looked right into my eyes as she shook her head in an unspoken, don't finish that kind of way. We looked into each other's tear-filled eyes as she shared a sympathetic smile with me before wiping my cheeks off with her thumbs. I didn't know what to expect next, but before I could react, Abigail leaned down to kiss me. 
My heart was racing again, but not in the way it was before. I had never felt this way. Not even Sasha had ever had this kind of effect on me. Was this normal? Was this what it was supposed to feel like? Now knowing she had let every opportunity to kill me pass, I gently placed my hands on her hips and sank into this wonderful emotion. Her fangs gently poked me, but never hard enough to ruin the moment. Her skin and her mouth were cold, but there was still some heat to her breath. The smell of her hair had a slight smokiness to it. It was almost of coal or ash, but again, wasn't harsh or overpowering. Though she didn't smell how one would expect the living dead to smell, she was still far from anything I would have ever imagined. And although her skin was chilled to the touch, she made up for it all in emotional warmth. It felt like that kiss lasted forever, and I wish it had. But soon, she leaned her head back once again. We separated and locked eyes like before, but this time there was something else there. Though I remember the conversation we had just had, and I remember her creeping over me only a few days ago, my mind had never been more at peace. The voices in my head that would be screaming at me if I was merely trying to talk to Anne were gone. My head was quiet, and my anxiety was nowhere to be found. After a second, I pulled my head back into her chest. I wrapped my arms around her middle and took a huge sigh of relief. Even after all these years of talking to therapists and doctors, I had never felt as calm and understood as I did just then. We held each other like that for a while, letting the candles burn low, before throwing out the now cold food and moving on to the dessert. Day 10, Part 4 Another hour passed with light conversation and jokes. Once that was all done, we cleared the table and then found ourselves in the living room, moving the furniture off to the side. With the couch and chairs out of the way, we now had a large open space in the middle of the room. I kicked my shoes off as I scrolled through my iPod, looking for some classical music. I tried showing her my entertainment system, thinking she had never seen such technology before. But she only laughed and reminded me that she had seen this country grow from before the light bulb and was very much aware of what everything was. Though she hadn't used much in the way of smart devices, she said she has been watching a lot of people use them over the years. With the lights down low and the soft music playing, Abigail pulled me in close and moved my arms like a mannequin as she began teaching me how to dance. Being that I had never gone dancing, she had to show me. However, she seemed more than happy to do it. This was the closest I had ever felt to anyone, possibly ever. Her smile and embrace made me forget my loneliness that night. No greater gift had ever been given to me. As the hour of music went on, we laughed and ignored our pasts. Everything outside the house ceased to exist while the music played. We went from slow dancing to more upbeat styles as the musical genres changed, despite my having zero skills in any of them. All the music had been played, and all the food we felt like consuming had been eaten. I finished putting what little remained into the fridge, turned off the kitchen lights, and then walked back into the living room. I stopped at the edge of the dimly lit space as I saw Abigail lying on the couch. She was resting with a very happy smile on her face before looking up at me. I didn't know what was happening and was confused by the fact that she was still here. Not that I wanted her gone in the slightest. It was just that I was used to her disappearing into the night like the phantom I still saw her as. What? I asked. The lady vampire propped herself on one arm and waved me over with the other. Come here, she said sweetly. Still unsure, I walked over to the couch. As soon as I was close enough, Abigail gently grabbed my hand. My eyes widened as Abigail pulled me down onto the couch with her. I was now on my back, with her resting on one of my arms, with her between me and the back of the couch. She placed her hand and her head on my chest as I moved my arm beneath her to a more comfortable position. I faced the ceiling for a little while as I found myself running my fingers through her hair. Her expanding and contracting chest pressed against mine as she quietly breathed. I was tense for a good while, not sure what I was supposed to do and if this was okay, 
before her soft murmurs started putting me to sleep. Before I passed out, my whole body relaxed, more than it normally would in my bed upstairs. A single tear fell from my eye. This time, it was not from sadness, but from a feeling of happy content. The same person I was terrified of only a few days ago was now holding me in the safest arms I would have ever imagined being in. Surprisingly, she fell asleep before me. It was also a surprise that she needed to sleep the same way I did. We slept on the couch that night, holding each other with our own breathing, serving as calming white noise. Even if she did kill me in my sleep, I would have died happy. Day 11 That morning, I woke up with a note on my chest, where I had last seen her face. The note was written in the most elegant handwriting I had ever seen. In the note, she asked if I could show her some movies that night. She explained that she had never really seen one from the comfort of a couch before. She had only really watched a few through cracks in walls and through windows while she was stalking some of her past prey. She wanted a normal movie-watching experience, and I was going to give her one. After reading the to-do list she left for me, I jumped off the couch and started setting up the furniture for the evening's entertainment. Later, I went out and picked up some snacks, soda, and candy to make the at-home theater feel more complete. If this was going to be her first real movie night, then it was going to be the best. Luckily, I had already saved a large selection of some of my favorite movies on my various streaming accounts. I queued up five films to be ready to go. Each one was one of the best films of the past decade. My movies of choice were Star Wars, The Wizard of Oz, The Gladiator, The Princess Bride, and Casablanca. Not sure if we'd be able to get through them all, but we would see. I also tried to not pick out films with too many visual effects. But being that she was more familiar with tech and gadgets than I would have thought, a little bit of some spectacle might be fine. It was seven at night, and the sun was just going down. As I finished getting everything ready, I heard a knock at the door. I turned towards my house's entrance with a surprising level of excitement. Normally, I would avoid people stopping by and wouldn't set up for a visit, but this was the second night in a row. I checked to make sure my shirt was still tucked in as I walked up to the door. I grabbed the handle and then took a deep breath before slowly swinging it open. I smiled as I saw my vampire friend dressed in a large old coat, scarf, and hat. Some of the sunlight was still creeping over the roofs and trees, so to protect herself, she covered every inch of her body and head. It wasn't until the door was opened all the way, and she took a few steps inside, that she looked up out of the scarf. She looked a little silly from how bundled up she was, because the temperature was far from cold. Did she walk all this way like that? She smiled as I helped her remove her protective layers and put them away in the closet. Happily, I led her to the living room, where the couch and coffee table had been set up with all the snacks and drinks. The lights were low, and the movies were all lined up ready to be played. I'd even thrown a large blanket over the back of the couch, just in case. I actually felt proud of how well I planned this. But before actually stepping into the living room, she stopped. I came to a halt right behind her, and leaned around to see what might have given her pause. Her expression was hard to read, and it didn't really seem like she was looking at anything in particular. Is everything okay? I asked. She didn't say anything, and her silence was starting to get me worried. Is it too much? It's the blanket, isn't it? I can... But before I finished my blathering, she turned to me with another smile. No, it's fine. I was just thinking how nice all this is. She assured. Seriously, you shouldn't doubt yourself so much. She then walked into the room and looked over the arrangement of treats before looking back at me. It's all still kind of new to me, that's all. Many people had said that to me, but coming from her, it hit a little stronger. We made ourselves cozy on the couch and piled mountains of junk food in our laps. Halfway into the first movie, I couldn't help but stare at her as she leaned with excitement towards the screen. I'd seen all the movies many times, but watching her enjoy them made the experience even more wonderful. She sat at the edge of the couch throughout most of the night, asking me as many questions as she could think of. I don't know who was having a better time, me watching her or her watching the films. We finished each flick by skipping the credits to save time 
and ended at about 5.30 in the morning. As soon as the last movie finished, Abigail quickly jumped up from the cushions and ran to the closet, grabbed her hat, scarf, and coat before heading out the door. I was caught off guard by her rapid exiting and stumbled off the couch to my feet shortly behind her. While bundling herself up and vanishing into the shadows, she told me that she had never played any board games with anyone and wondered if I had any. But she didn't wait for my response before winking, smiling, and disappearing. I ran over to the door to try and watch her leave, but like so many other times, saw nothing. I then smiled and scratched my head as I laughed a little to myself, before turning to the emptiness and bowing to no one. As you wish. I closed the door, turned off the TV, and retired to the couch where I gazed up at the ceiling before passing out. Day 12 I woke up at one in the afternoon to my phone ringing. I answered it, trying hard to pretend like I wasn't just asleep in the middle of the day. It was my boss on the other end, checking up on me, seeing how I was doing. I told him I felt great, but was mostly thinking about Abigail and not any sort of sickness. Thankfully, I was in solid enough mind to not say anything about vampires out loud. He was glad to hear that I was well, and wanted to make sure that I was still available for work the following workday. I paused for a moment, because I had forgotten about work. I had been having so much fun with my nighttime guest that it had totally slipped my mind that I still needed a job. Trying not to sound disappointed, I told my boss, Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be there. Awesome. See you later, he said before hanging up. I slowly placed the phone down, thinking about how distracted I had been the last few days, how every thought of mine had been dedicated to someone who was from a different time and universe. Someone who I didn't even know if I could actually be with. I shook my head to knock myself out of my trance. I took a while to think about what all was going on in my life and what I should do about it as I cleaned up the living room. I set the furniture back to their original positions and vacuumed up all the crumbs from the snacks. Later, I was hunched over dusty boxes in the attic, digging through them for some interesting games to play. After a good search... I found some of my favorite board games to lug downstairs. But as I grabbed the last game, I saw the box with my father's photo still resting on top. I stopped and set my armful of boxes down before leaning over to take another look at the snapshot. Looking at my father's face didn't hurt like it used to. Though it was still a sad memory, I didn't hate the sight of it anymore. Looking through the window into the past, I remembered everything Abigail and I had shared since we met. If I could face one of my demons, I could stare this one down too. After a second, I gripped the photo in my hand as I kneeled over to rummage through the rest of the box. I pulled out five frames with Dad, Mom, and me and placed them on top of the board game boxes before carefully making my way down the ladder. I set up the dining area with all the activities for tonight's playful rivalry before heading to the hallway to unpack the box of photos. I took my time cleaning up the frames in order for them to be presentable. Not just to anyone else who might see them, but for myself as well. I found a nice place by the steps to hang the picture of me and my father at the football game alongside one of all three of us. I felt sad looking over the wall of memories. Not because I felt guilt like I normally would, but because I missed him. After a calm moment of silence, I smiled and then went back to setting up for the night. Day 13, Part 1 That night, I waited on the couch for her to arrive. It was two in the morning when she finally showed up at the front door again. As soon as I heard her knock, I jumped up and bolted for the door. I opened it with a smile and a shortness of breath as I welcomed her in. She smiled and politely bowed as she entered. She didn't dress up in multiple layers this time and only came wearing her usual black dress. I guess, being that she didn't seem to sweat there would be no need to wash it. As I closed the door, I noticed there was something odd about her this time. She seemed tired or something, but I couldn't figure out what that might be. Being that I wasn't positive if she was just being calmer than normal, or was actually losing sleep from coming over, I decided to leave it alone. We were making our way down the hall, when she stopped by the stairs and saw the pictures up on the wall. She looked over her shoulder at me with an almost sad smile. I knew what she was thinking, and neither of us needed to say anything. She turned around 
and walked into my chest while wrapping her arms around me in a soft hug. I rested my cheek on her head as I looked over at the photos of that young, happy family. I wiped a tear from my eye as we broke apart and walked towards the dining table. We spent the next few hours playing games like Monopoly, Sorry, Life, and Mousetrap. I loved these games when I was a kid and was delighted to see her enjoying them too. Afterward, she decided to school me in chess, beating me in under eight moves within five minutes each time we played. But even though she was in her element, she didn't have the same spunk and personality I was expecting at this point. I looked up at her and asked, Are you... but was interrupted as she looked up and smiled at me. I still remember the smell of the sea as I would stand on the cliffs of Mar and look out over the ocean. She said in a happy memory kind of way. Almost everything else would be unrecognizable. I'm sure that view would still feel the same. When she finished, I felt a small amount of sadness spill out from her words, but didn't know if I was supposed to say anything. As I thought about replying, Abigail looked up at the clock. Her expression dropped a little, but she said nothing. Hey, uh, I eventually blurted. Why don't you just... I swallowed dryly before continuing. You know, stay here, with me. Instead of sleeping in an old clock tower, I finished and waited apprehensively for her answer. She took a while, but then slowly turned to me. She had a slightly serious look on her face as she looked me up and down. I waited patiently with confusion before she finally stood up from the table. Come with me. Her words weren't happy, but not necessarily mad. It was more monotone and a bit withheld. I calmly slid my chair back and got up to follow her out of the dining area. I was confused as she guided me upstairs and into the bedroom. I stopped at the doorway and watched her make her way to the side of my bed. What's up? I nervously asked. Abigail stopped by the side table and turned towards me with a slightly angry look and pointed at the drawer. Open it she said. A cold chill ran through me as I knew what was inside. Slowly, I walked over to where she was and stood a few feet away from the bed and her with the side table between me and the wall. I looked up into her scolding eyes before taking a deep breath and grabbing the knob. My heart raced as I slowly pulled out the drawer to reveal the suicide note I had left for people to find. I glanced back at her through the corner of my eyes to see her steadfast and waiting. Pack it up, my vampire friend softly demanded. With a look of shame, I retrieved the handwritten letter and straightened back up in front of her. I didn't look at her and only stared at the white of the paper as she, on the other hand, kept glaring at me. My hands shook as I held it for a while before she gave me another instruction. No, she said with tenderness, but still a level of upset. Wrap it up. At that moment, she was the antithesis to all the negative voices that had been in my head. My vision of the note started to blur as my eyes filled with tears. A few drops fell and seeped into the paper before my shaking hands shredded the suicide note into multiple segments. I ripped them into the smallest pieces I could with a wave of sad anger and threw the shreds to the ground. As soon as the paper left my hands, Abigail jumped into my arms for the tightest embrace she had ever given me. After she crashed into me, I finally let out a gasp for air because I had been holding my breath the entire time. My breathing and sobs were shaky. My heart was pounding against my ribs. Though it was only a single sheet of white printer paper, it felt like I had finally let go of an anvil that was holding me at the bottom of the ocean. I need to know you will never feel that way or write anything like that again. Abigail said with her face half buried into my chest. No matter what happens, okay? I managed to take a moment between cries to answer her with a head shake. But a nonverbal reply wasn't enough for her, and she quickly looked up at me with eyes full of tears as well. I need to hear you say it. Promise me. She insisted. I took another deep breath and looked back into her eyes. Okay. I promise. She smiled and sunk her head back into my shirt as we let our emotions run free with no restraint. In the past week, I had gone from confused, terrified, depressed, 
happy, and now relieved. I don't think I had ever let go of so many fears and painful memories in my life. I never thought I would ever hug someone like this and cry with them ever again. I wouldn't have imagined myself spending so much time with someone without feeling like I was wasting their time. Day 13, Part 2 A few minutes flew by with us holding each other before we wiped our eyes with a huge sigh of relief. I was about to walk her back out of the bedroom so that we could finish our evening of gaming, but felt her hand squeeze mine. Hey, let's lie down for a bit, she said as she pulled me towards the mattress. You can clean up later. Oh, okay. I figured resting a bit might help her recharge, so I agreed. I followed her to the bed, and together we laid on top of the covers. I faced the ceiling with my head on my pillow and her head on my chest. Years ago, I had trouble carrying conversations, let alone sleeping with anyone beside me. Now, I was relaxed and calm, with zero fears of leaving myself exposed and vulnerable. Inviting her over and welcoming her in was, though still new and awkward, not something I dreaded in any way. And opening myself up like a book to be freely judged was not torture anymore. After a while of almost drifting off to sleep, she finally spoke. I've lived a long life and have outlived a lot of people I fell for. Though she was almost whispering, I heard the sadness in her voice. She spoke with hesitancy and took her time with her words. I looked down at her on my chest. What? I tried living with normal people before, but watching them grow old while I stay the same age hurts every time. I've forgotten more faces and names than you have ever known. Her words trailed off as she was thinking back in sad memories. Her voice was starting to get softer as the time went on. Not that she was asleep, but because she seemed to be trying to not say anything that I might get mad or upset at. But try as she might, a part of me was writhing and twisting up from the implications. Uh, no, I wouldn't wish being like me on anyone, she continued. Even though we would be able to walk the earth forever, we would never be able to have a family. I would always feel an unquenchable thirst while being hunted and feared. My heart sank again, and I said nothing. Though I hadn't actually thought that far ahead, it wasn't hard to understand what she was saying. Letting what she said settle in my head for a minute, she eventually looked up at me. How do you feel? I took a deep breath before answering. What do you mean? Before we met, you were sad and depressed. She looked lovingly into my eyes. How do you feel now? I thought about it for a while. Her saying that we wouldn't be together forever had just slammed my emotions hard, while at the same time, thinking back on the past few days were still some of the best times in my recent life. The truth? I asked after thinking for a moment. Abigail nodded and waited patiently. I stared up at the ceiling and thought about how I used to see her over me as I put my thoughts in order. I needed to make sure what I was about to say was actually what I felt and not just what she wanted to hear. Even if our friendship only lasts a short while and we end up having to part ways, I paced myself and sighed realizing what I was saying was the truth. I can't see myself being that unhappy or scared of life ever again. Hearing me finish my words with a calm steadiness, she smiled before wrapping her arms around me tighter as she spoke. I'm so glad to hear that. I didn't know why I was still wandering the earth. But when I felt what you were feeling, I was curious and wanted to know more. Her tears were now leaving a wet spot on my shirt as she talked. Your pain had to have been why I was still here. And if it was the last thing I did, I wanted to make sure you knew you were loved and not a waste of time. My eyes were starting to hurt from all the crying. I turned on my side and wrapped my arms around her. Thank you, I said. Is there a woman you fancy out there? She looked up as she asked. I paused for a moment and then said, You mean at work? Y yeah. What's her name? I had to think back before answering. It had been a while since I had even thought about anyone but me and Abigail. Anne, I finally said. 
Ask her out. I sat up a bit. You sure? But what about... She placed a finger on my lips, interrupting me. She gently guided my head back onto the pillow with a press from her fingers. Promise me. She said before leaning in and kissing me softly on the cheek. She then laid her head back down on my chest. Promise me you will never let love slip through your fingers. Promise me you will always let people into your life and not shut them out and... She stopped and squeezed me tighter for a second before continuing. And promise me you will never again try to kill yourself. I was emotional as I responded in all honesty. I promise. She then maneuvered herself over me a little and looked into my eyes before kissing me sweetly on the lips. Afterward, she slid back beside me. No matter what happens in life, please be happy. At this point, I noticed her voice getting quieter and softer as she spoke. She was probably falling asleep. I didn't want to wake her, but still wanted to give her my assurance. I will, I quietly answered. I looked back up to the ceiling and began thinking about the first time I saw her crawling above me. It was so long ago when I was scared of her, and it felt like an eternity when last I would have been scared to have anyone in my house, let alone sleep with me. But now, it was as natural to me as brushing my teeth and setting my alarm. Will you stay with me tonight? I asked. She smiled as she whispered. Yes. We held each other and slipped away into our dreams as the curtains of sleep closed on us. Day 14 I had never slept so well in my life. For the first time in a long time, I had pleasant dreams. Dreams of faces that didn't intimidate me and people I wanted to be with. Strangely, though, it wasn't about me and her. Instead, it was about me and Anne. Something about getting ready for future chapters in my life. Chapters I now felt I was ready for. I woke up with sunlight stretching across my face. My open curtains revealed the bright orange sky of morning. I smiled as I lay on my left side, reaching over behind me to where Abigail was lying. But, as my hand met where her hair was supposed to be, I felt a warm spot covered in chalky dust. The light made it hard to adjust my eyes, so I continued searching with my hands. However, I only felt more empty space. I looked down at my chest with one half-opened eye, hoping to see her hand resting on me. But instead, I saw an empty sleeve from the black dress I had become so familiar with. My eyes widened, my heart dropped, and my blood went cold. I felt as scared as I did when I first saw her climbing on my walls. But this time, the fear was completely different. Not being afraid for my life, but the slow realization that something had happened to my friend. I slowly moved from my side onto my back and turned my head to the opposite side of the bed. I hope no one else ever has to feel what I did as soon as my suspicions were confirmed. What I saw lying beside me wasn't the fair skin, black hair, or red eyes of the vampire who had become my dearest sleeping buddy. Instead, I was unfortunately greeted by a sad absence with only an empty Victorian gown with ash residue sprinkled around its openings. My eyes immediately began to water up as I grabbed a fistful of the dark cloth. The sunlight! I thought I'd closed all the curtains! How were they open? I clung to the garment and pulled it close, as if she was still inside. My crying and screams were uncontrollable at this point. My sad voice called out for her with the most desperate of hope that she was still somewhere within my house. But after a long while of waiting with no response, I continued my anguish without words. My mind raced with the thoughts that I had done this to her and that I had killed my friend. But yet, I had vivid memories of closing all the windows and shutting the light out tight. I laid there for several minutes before I realized there was a note folded up inside the neck of the dress. Sitting up, I quickly opened the letter and read, To my beloved friend, this is not how I would have wanted to tell you, and not how I would have ever wanted you to find out. 
But if you are reading this, then I have passed away. Please be at ease knowing that I am resting in peace. I am sure this will be hard for you to read, and you may think it hypocritical for me to willingly depart after all we had talked about, but I assure you it was for the best. I didn't kill myself or let myself die because I died hundreds of years ago. My body and mind were just barely holding on. I died before I came to this wonderful continent, but I have never been able to rest. My thirst for blood and hunger for flesh was all I knew after a while, and my remaining humanity had been almost completely forgotten. Then I met you. Before you, I thought this was my fate. To forever stay a monster. But then I realised I was here because you needed someone. Unlike me, you were fixable and could be cured. All you needed was someone to show you how to live and face your fears. But I also knew that if you and I were to continue this way, we would both end up regretting it. I would either wander the earth forever while you grew old and died, or you would ask me to kill you and turn you into a vampire. But seeing how you had a chance to be happy without the insatiable hunger for stalking living prey, I wanted to make sure you got to live your best life, even if it meant it had to be without me. Let this be a perspective shift for you as well. Though I don't want you to be hurt due to my passing, I want you to think about how those who love you would feel if you recklessly ended your life. I assure you, they would be feeling as much, if not more, pain than you do right now. But even with that said, do not hurt yourself over my death or feel as if you are responsible. You did nothing wrong, and I hope your grief is temporary. I want you to know that I have never been happier in all the years, alive or dead. And I have you to thank for that. I could see in your eyes that meeting each other changed us both. I hope you now realise that it is never too late. Never too late to live to be loved, or forgive yourself. Please, forgive yourself. Please be loved. Let people in and let your feelings out. Never keep family, friends, and loved ones away from how you feel. A life of pure solitude is to be the living dead. Trust me, that is no life to live. Please don't cry over my passing, because I could not have been more calm or happy to have spent my last day beside you. Remember. You promised me you would strive to be happy, and keeping that promise is what you will do. When it is all said and done, I know we will meet again. You showed me and know how to express love. Now go out there and show the world. Show her, whoever and wherever she is. Love, Abigail Cara Walsh. As I read, my expression went from overwhelming sadness to understanding and calm. I wasn't happy to read her passing message to me, but I didn't feel as inconsolably upset. It was also partly a relief that it wasn't because of some foolish mistake I made or something I had forgotten. If I had any hand in her demise, I would have no idea what I would have done. And although our time together was too short, and there was so much more I would have loved to talk about, how long should I have expected a relationship with a 400-year-old dead woman to last? I read her note several times over before folding up neatly and setting it inside the side table drawer where my own sad goodbye letter once rested. I then neatly folded up my old friend's beautiful black dress and collected the dust that poured out. I put her ashes into an empty jar and I placed her dress into an empty shoebox. I wish I had nicer ways of storing her remains, but I was unprepared for what kind of memorial activities I would be doing today. The day went on in a somber silence that seemed to last forever. I tried to stay calm through the afternoon and evening, but found myself looking over areas where I had seen her face. I so badly wish she was standing there. I found it impossible to keep my emotions under control even while putting away a chess game that would now never be completed. Finally, I was all cried out and had no more moisture left to shed more tears. I slowly walked throughout the house, lost in my thoughts, 
as I vacuumed, washed dishes, and made the bed. I decided to leave the side where she slept unattended for now and just let the wrinkles stay. I gathered up and stored her dress and ashes in my closet in a cozy corner that would be out of sight but not far from me. I never wanted to forget her in any way and wasn't about to stow away any more memories into my dusty attic. Never again would I hide monuments to people I have loved and lost. My eyes were still red as I finally crashed on the couch. I tried to think as much as I could about every wonderful moment we shared those last few days and how nothing lasts forever. After relaxing from my full house cleaning, I took a nice long shower like I used to. On my way downstairs, I saw the photo of me and my dad on the wall. I paused for a moment, thinking not only about my father, but also of those red eyes that were once watching over my shoulder. My life was changed forever and could never go back to how it was, whether that was before the first night she stalked me or the few days we enjoyed each other's company, the fact still remained. This would be an all-new me and an all-new life, no matter what direction I took. I took in a deep breath and thought that the most disrespectful thing I could do in memory of her was not to at least try to make the most out of life. It was hard to sleep. I tried to not think about the sad negative, and instead thank her for sticking around as long as she did. Day 15 I woke up at 7.30 in the morning. I ate, showered, got dressed, and brushed my teeth. I did my best to keep my energy high, but it was the hardest thing I had ever had to do. It had been a long time since I had to go on with life after someone close to me passed away. The emptiness still stung my heart, no matter what I did, and it would be years before the stinging wasn't as sharp. But, unlike before, I was able to remind myself that it wasn't my fault. As I came in for my first day back at work, I felt different. A change had come over me, but not in a bad way. Everyone was nice to me as I walked in. No more than they usually were, but this time, I actually noticed it. My boss patted me on the back as I returned to my workspace. He said he was glad to have me back. He laughed and said that my vacation was over before leaving me to start work. I thought to myself, if only he knew. If only someone knew. After an hour passed, Anne came over to my desk. Feeling better? She asked in her wonderfully friendly way. I didn't want to lie, but honesty would be too much. Almost, I replied. That's good to hear. We all missed you. She continued with a smile. Her glow was hard to not reciprocate. Thanks, I replied. And thank you for checking up on me while I was stuck at home. Oh yeah, don't mention it. I would have checked up on you more, but I lost my phone and had to get a new one. As she said this, she pulled her new phone out of her pocket. Oh, <laughs> I said as I laughed a little. She looked confused by my reaction. Why, what's up? I waved it off with a friendly gesture. Oh, it's, it's nothing. I remembered my text from earlier. I laughed at how badly I felt for bothering her and thought she was ignoring me. Just goes to show how quick I was to assume the worst. Anne shrugged. Okay. Well, guess I should head back to my work. She said, turning back to her desk. I nodded as she turned and walked away. But she had taken only five steps when I turned back and called out to her. Hey, Anne! I said. She stopped and looked back with a puzzled look. Yes? I wouldn't have normally called out to her from across the space like that, but nothing in my head stopped me this time. I need to get all caught up with everything while I was away, there's stuff I don't understand. Is there any way we could maybe meet up after work to go over some things? It looked like she was about to say yes before she stopped to think for a moment and then shrugged again. I would, but my boyfriend and I already have plans tonight. Maybe tomorrow? I had no idea she was already with someone. I was so caught up in my own world that I never thought to ask. However, as much of a blow as this would have been to the old me... It didn't hurt like I thought it would. I had already been made well aware that life doesn't go according to plan. I smiled and said, Tomorrow works. 
Okay, see you then. With that, Anne turned back around and walked away. I was surprised by the fact that I didn't know she was already with someone, but it didn't really upset me. Looking at my life now and my life a few weeks ago, not much had changed. I was still living and sleeping alone, and Anne was still out of reach. But now I knew it wasn't due to a lack of trying. It was just how the dice fell in this particular instance. This also meant that I should look elsewhere and not focus on Anne as any more than a co-worker. No more worrying that I was blowing my chances, and no more worrying that I was looking like a fool. Now I could talk to her with zero pressure of driving her away. Day 16 A few weeks later, my mother and I decided to have dinner at a nice restaurant for the first time in years. It was my father's birthday, and ever since he passed, I've tried to stay home and sleep through that day. This time, however, we smiled and talked about the happy moments of the past. We had a good time chatting about the old days and laughed instead of the usual sorrow-filled reminiscing. After we had finished eating, our server Jenny came over to ask us if we wanted dessert. We didn't usually splurge on cheesecake, but we felt the occasion called for it. As our waitress walked away with our order, my mother leaned over to me with a whisper and a coy wink. She seems nice. I looked over my shoulder with a smile. Yes. Yes, she does. That night, after having spent one of the best evenings with my mother in a long time, I put my key into the door and entered my house. There was something about the once sad and empty space. Though nothing had really changed, it felt different. The walls had a warm glow to them, and the air wasn't stagnant and cold like it was two weeks ago. This wasn't just the depressing place where I recharged before work anymore. I didn't use it as a hideout in between work and all other locations I hated. It was relaxing and happy. Final Entry I had taken some time off after being back at work for a while and took a short trip to Ireland. I was standing on the cliffs of Moore, looking out over the sea. The sound of the waves and tall grass spun together a beautiful song of nature that perfectly set the mood. A cool wind whipped around me, with my jacket trying to get away from me with every gust. I soaked in the environment before taking the jar of ashes out of my shoulder bag. I held the glass container in my hand and smiled with a warmth of wonderful memories before removing the lid. Welcome home, Abigail, I said with a smile. I kissed the side of the jar as a final goodbye before tossing her remains upward to be caught up by the ocean winds. A swirl of air spun around me with her ashes dancing in the sunlight. I then watched as the air current gathered up and swept my friend to wherever she wanted to go. After taking a second to enjoy some fresh, coastal Irish air, I turned to a large rock a few feet from me and rested on it. I pulled out a journal that my therapist friend recommended I use to record my experiences. The idea was for me to log my daily accomplishments, but I also wanted to catalog my days with Abigail. I leaned my head back and thought of the time before we first met as I put pen to paper. Day One I had just gotten off work and was hating myself for letting Anne walk by without saying anything to her again. An all-too-familiar loathing permeated the air around me. The End You are not alone. You are never without options, or people to turn to. You are never living the worst life that has ever been lived, and you can always find someone to help. Life can always get better, but if it ends, you will never know how good it could have been and those who love you will never be able to see all the great things you could have accomplished. The person who has been waiting for the right moment to ask you out will miss their chance, and the doors to what you want to do with your life will never open. If you are feeling like you are at the end of your rope and can't find help in your friends and family, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Any time, any day. And I promise you, someone who understands how you feel 
will be waiting on the other line. And for those who are outside of the United States, please take the time to search for the help numbers in your country. I love you, and God bless. Timothy Banfield You've just listened to The Black Dress by Timothy Banfield. Recorded by Timothy Banfield. Also recorded by Marissa Duran. Also recorded by Marissa Falsone. All copyrights held by Timothy Banfield, 2021.